Good evening. My name is Paige Nesbitt, and I'm the Director of Marketing Communications in the Benjamin M. Statler College of Engineering and Mineral Resources. On behalf of the Statler College of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee and the WVU Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, I welcome you to the Black History Month panel discussion honoring NASA pioneer Katherine Johnson. This evening's discussion will be presented through the Zoom platform. This session will be recorded and later archived on the Statler College website. To view closed captions or subtitles, click on the CC button in the bar at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, use the Q&A function also found at the bottom of your screen. To further secure this discussion today, participants will only be able to see questions that are answered by one of our moderators. To ask a question, click on the Q&A button, a separate screen will appear, and that is where you could type your question. Please note many of your questions will be answered as our panelists make their presentation. Therefore, we will not be answering until after the discussion. We'll answer as many questions as we can live. If you have any issues with audio and video during the discussion, please review your personal Zoom settings. If the issue persists, please email statler-dei at mail.wvu.edu. February is Black History Month. Throughout the month, we celebrate the achievements of African American and important roles that they have played in shaping American history, culture, science, and beyond. But Black History Month is also a time to recognize the historic moments and personal experiences that educate our nation on diversity and the power of representation. My name is Teresa Ladino, and I am the chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee at the Statler College. My pronouns are she, her. My colleague and DEI committee member, Paige Nisbeth, and I on behalf of our committee and in partnership with the WVU Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, invite you all to recognize the life and legacy of Katherine Johnson, her story of resilience and her impact. Today, our committee also wants, you to also wants to invite you to take that story and apply it to yourself. You can have the dream you want to have. You can be the change you want to be and you can inspire change in others. While we tell the story of Katherine Johnson, we'll emphasize that is the story within us that needs to be told. Today, we'll be educating while learning to be resilient. We'll be guided through the conversation with personal stories and experiences of two powerful and inspirational women, our panelists, community leaders and advocates. It is my pleasure to introduce now Vice President Ms. Rapport and Ms. Kerry Nuts. Now I ask them to say a few words. Vice President Poor. Well, first I wanna say thank you so much, Dr. Danu, for allowing me to be on the panel today. I look forward to the conversation with um, the other panelists. Kerry, I look forward to everyone's comments um, and answering questions. So let me just say, I'm extremely excited about this um, event. Um, I, I think that we, we have to have more discussions like this to ensure that we are meeting each other where we are, but growing collectively as well. And so I look forward to, again, diving into the questions in more detail. Ms. Kerry Knott. Hi, yes, welcome. I, I um, also um, just wanna say thank you so much for um, inviting me to this. Um, it is an absolute honor to uh, be here and participate in this conversation. Um, anything to do with Katherine Johnson, um, is, it's just amazing to be involved in this. Um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we have on this and anything um, highlighting strong women, I'm, I'm really excited to be part of this. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Page. To understand where people are today and how they came to be, it is helpful to see the path they have taken. NASA mathematician and fighter for racial equality, a champion of STEM education, Mrs. Katherine Johnson stands among NASA's most inspirational and brilliant figures figures. 
Many of us discovered Mrs. Johnson through the Academy Award nominated movie, Hidden Figures. Born in 1918 in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, Mrs. Johnson loved mathematics. She loved to count. She discovered a world in which she excelled. At the age of 10, she attended high school. By the age of 18, she graduated from West Virginia State University with two degrees in mathematics and French. In the powerful words of her teacher, Dr. William W. Shiflin Clater, you'd make a great research mathematician. And so she did. She became an incredible NASA mathematician who helped put an astronaut into orbit around the moon and later helped put the first man on the moon. But her road to success and recognition was not an easy one. Marginalized and segregated, biased against within the male dominated field, many times overlooked. She remained confident and determined. She was resilient. She became the compass who would dictate when and how her voice will start sounding loud and clear. lessons that Katrin Johnson left for us? What is the message that we all could take and apply to become the power of resilience? Our distinguished panelists will talk about resilience through the eye and perspective that Mrs. Johnson has created. I will lead the questions for the panelists and Paige will monitor the questions from our audience. We'll engage in this thoughtful and powerful dialogue. So let us start. Mrs. Johnson, recalled her father as the tallest and straightest man in the area. She loved her father a great deal, and he was a big influence in her life. He was her guide throughout her education, career, and every aspect of her life. She taught her own children the importance of the moral compass and how inspiration you find in others leads to motivation and a changed outlook. For our panelists today, who was the tallest person in your life? In other words, who has influenced you? Well, I would say it's difficult to pick one person, but I will say that my mother and my father definitely, um, you know, they're the roots of who I am. Um, I think that you, I, I would just say clearly, I wouldn't be who I am without being able to come home and someone instill that level of uh, assurance in me uh, that there were no limits, even though the world attempted to provide those limits or show those limits, they removed them as quickly as they could, as many times as they needed to. I think another person I definitely think should be, um, should be mentioned is Judge Irene Berger. Judge Irene Berger is someone who, of course, me being a lawyer, she's someone I watched and I, you know, I paid attention to as I was as traveling throughout my career before I knew what a lawyer was. She was the only black female judge I'd ever seen. 
And, and I began to just navigate it. And now to be able to call her a friend, it means a lot to, to have her. And she's been throughout my career from Howard University to Southern Law School to when I was a legislature. She traveled throughout that career with me, maybe not hands-on every day, but I knew that she was watching and she was proud of who I was becoming as someone who emulated her, um, her career. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Your thoughts? Yes, sorry, I was unclicking something there. Um, it's definitely not just one person. Um, there is one person that stands out and, and I'm gonna address that last. I think I'm gonna start with my, 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 my grandma and my Grammy. Um, I wanna really tie this. One thing I, I probably should have said in the introduction is part of why I'm so proud um, to be here um, talking about strong women and um, at, for WVU is, you know, I, I grew up um, in love with West Virginia because my father uh, was from Grafton and he went to WVU. Um, there was no person that loved that state more than my father. Um, his mother, Nellie, Nellie Knotts uh, was from Grafton. Um, she birthed 13 children um, and raised 11 of them, two of them didn't make it. She was such a strong woman. Um, her husband was away in the coal mines working. She really never saw him um, and she raised those kids. So I, I grew up with this strong icon. She made apple butter and bread and um, she just was an incredible, incredible hardworking woman. So, so my love for West Virginia and, um, and the school and the state started that way. And my dad just really instilled in me um, really connecting to something. I, I was living outside of Boston, Massachusetts, but I loved the state of West Virginia. So having that spirit built in me, um, the other side of the family, um, my, my Grammy, uh, my mom's mom was, um, she went to grad school and um, she was born in the early, early 1900s. So it was pretty amazing. Um, she was a teacher um, and she was just incredible. And she was gonna go to law school, but it was either Mary, my grandfather, or go to law school. So she, she got married and had my mom. Um, and so I, I was really inspired by a lot of strong women. My mom is absolutely my biggest role model. Um, she believed I could do anything and uh, she expected me to do anything. And um, all along the way, she was doing everything. She was an incredibly strong woman with a, an amazing career, totally different, different mind than mine. But I, I owe a lot to her because um, she never, there, there wasn't anything that she thought I couldn't do. And to have a, have a woman in my life that was that strong, um, to be that kind of a mentor um, really is, is what got me started. So I would say that. Thank you. And the follow up to that, and uh, both of you have hinted to who is influencing you today, because the change that you have seen, correct, as kids or the persons that you have taken with you in your life, they made a difference for you along the way, but they also make a difference today. So to make change within yourself and the world, who is your inspiration? You know, I, I, you know, I think it, you know, and I know the question is to pick one person, but I think that like everything, there's seasons to inspiration. It depends on where your life is and what you're dealing with and what challenges you're facing. And what I would say has been inspiration to me um, is, you know, our students and our faculty and our staff, when it comes to the social justice movement that we're all in the middle of, have been an inspiration to continue to push me forward as to why we need to do the type of work that we're doing. I think that you have to be able to have your eyes open to the things that are being done and things that are being said and listening to those things too that keeps you motivated. And what it really does, it takes me back to my, my original purpose. When I graduated from high school, one of the major, you know, the prayers that I said is, Lord, I just wanna help somebody. And that's not a made up thing. That's what has pushed me all throughout my career is I just wanna help somebody. And, and, and what I think we sometimes forget is um, that we have to look for inspiration, even though we may still have something over here. My mom is still here. Unfortunately, my, my, my father is, is looking down on me from heaven. But at the end of the day, you can say you have your mother and she's inspiring you and she has done that for you, but you still have to be motivated in other parts of your life. And so when I think about that we have to be flexible in knowing that the circumstance of the day, the circumstance of the season, where you need to be to make sure you're focused on your purpose is what should be that thing that guides you and be inspired, to be inspired by. Thank you. Yeah, this is, um, I, I, um, I love this question. 
because it really is about um, thinking about what is your purpose. And um, I've thought a lot about that lately. Um, everything I've done for a long time, I, I don't have my parents around anymore, um, um, but they're still with me. Uh, but my two sons, you know, it's, it's been about wh who am I and, and what world am I helping to create um, that my sons will live in? Well, they're, they're 18 and 20 now, so they're on their own. So just kidding. But they, they really, they were really what I did a lot for, you know, I worked at NASA for 20 years and I know our, and our values there. It's funny. I, I've been remembering a lot of our safety slogans um, this week. And, um, and we always had, uh, we used to wear these little these little cards that said, um, uh, this is why I'm safe, or this is why safety matters. I forget the exact thing, but we wore a picture of our kids uh, with us. So we always remember to be safe and everything that we did was, was based on keeping people alive. Um, and so that was a purpose. Um, but, you know, my kids are older now. I, you know, I've moved on, I've done a lot of different things, um, but I, I've, I've, I've heard a different, few different podcasts on this. I think it's really important, um, and Misha touched on this, but it, it's really having having that moral that moral thing, that thing that you're there for, um, that moral compass. So if there's a, if there's something I could inspire in my children and, and 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 other people is is you have to be anchored in that, right? You have to. It's a value system. You have to know what you're about, and then the decisions you make and and the paths you take line up to that. Um, you know, that, that's those values of, you know, um, being courageous to actually do that and stand up for what you believe in, um, the auth auth authenticity, right. To be who you are. Um, and there, there's so many amazing things I could say along this line, but I, I think for me, it's, is I'm driven to make a difference. Um, I don't want to just, uh, to be somebody that is doing a job. I want it to have purpose and meaning. And, and if something's not right, I, you know, I hope I, I will always have that courage to stand up to it or to try to make a change for it. So I, I think it's like a moral compass thing that drives me today. Thank you. And talking about differences, sometimes they are very obvious. Mrs. Johnson said, I asked questions. I wanted to know why. Mm -hmm. They got used to me asking questions and being the only woman there. For the two panelists today, were you the only women in there at some point in your life? Can you give us some examples and maybe talk to, uh, talk to us about your experiences and what lessons you have learned? Gary. Sure. Uh, uh, so, well, certainly I have been the only woman um, in, in, I'm sure, many circumstances. Um, I'll say that I, I've never really thought about that. Um, you know, my, in my life as an engineer, um, fortunately, you know, you just, you show up and you do the work. Um, so so I, I think the, that my, my, my experience with that, if, 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 if it were ever noticeable, um, it would be, yeah, because I'm a female, um, but it really wasn't if I'm there doing a job. I, I didn't really, I didn't really experience that. And, and it was there, but, um, you know, I think my advice would be, you know, you, you show up and you do the work. There's a task to be done and there's a mission to accomplish literally. And, um, I, I think I did that. And I think I probably, um, I had confidence um, and I had courage. Um, and I think that um, that's, that's how I really saw it is, is I showed up and did, I did my job. And so I will say, yes, I have experienced it. Yes, I have noticed it. And not only have I just noticed it of being just the only woman in the room, I've been the only black person in the room and the only black female in the room. And, and I've had that in, in, in most of my, uh, my, uh, my careers. And I agree with Carrie that you, you show up and you do the work because you're qualified to do the work. You're capable of doing the work. But I think I would be remiss in saying that that does not carry some level of weight and some level of trauma of having to always have to be better than the rest of the people in the room, even though you know you are already better than the people in the room. Um, to have people at times to attempt to undermine what you bring to the table. The reason why you were hired is not because you were a black woman or because you were a woman, it's because you were suited to be in that position, because you were qualified to be in that position. And it is unfortunate that, that, that there are 
people who have to, um, even though they are already incapable of doing the work, have to, um, uh, have to still prove themselves. Um, and I think when we even go to Katherine Johnson's life, at the end of the day, she was a proud West Virginian, but we didn't even know about her until well before she was about to pass. She was a West Virginian and she, had, she was being recognized other places before recognized home. So that goes to show you how history can be lost and how history can be lost or hidden for a lot of people uh, and a lot of population, black and brown communities particularly. Um, and and you, know, you might be surprised the person sitting beside you is the person that'll get you to the moon if you just gave them credit and gave them the ability to be, to be seen and be who they are. And so for me, I definitely think that while there are people who attempt to place limits, and I'll speak for just my life, for people who attempted to place limits on me, again, uh, good, for God's good grace, uh, he's basically made certain that I've still advanced. And so I'm very appreciative of that and those people that have been around me to continue to push me up like my family and good close friends. We promised the audience at the beginning that is the story within us that needs to be told. So I really appreciate both of you giving your answers and really connected with all of us about your personal experiences. I would like to remind everybody in the audience that you can ask questions and we make sure that we monitor your questions as we talk to the speaker, with the speaker. So please put your questions in the chat window and we'll be happy to address them. So going to the next question that we have for you, <clears throat> Katrin Johnson said that some things will drop out of the public eye and will go away. There will always be science, engineering and technology. And there will always be mathematics. Everything is physics and mathematics. To our panelists, what do you think about the importance of science and engineering and how did your experiences teach you to appreciate them? Well, I'm going to go first because I'm not a scientist. I am a lawyer by trade. <laughs> and so I, I'm going to just say this, though, that everything we do touches on science. Right. I mean, everything we do, if we're talking about makeup of your person like makeup from lipstick, from the COVID vaccine to the COVID, I mean, everything that we are experiencing uh, engages with with science and engineering. And so for me, I think that if it's something that you're passionate about, it's something that someone introduces you to coding, you know, the fact that we're on Zoom, it took someone to have to figure out the concept of making sure we all could figure that out, like to be able to be on this virtual world. And so um, I think there's a value in anything that a person puts their mind to. I think that we couldn't do what we need to do for this country without scientists and engineers. I think that we have to recognize that, you know, it's not a point of who's good at it, it's you're good at it. And if you're good at it, you need to step into your place and do the work. And so I will now lend it over to the scientists. <laughs> <laughs> that was way better than I could ever say, but I, I want to add a little bit into that. Um, just, you know, for anyone listening that's out there and pondering, why did I go into a STEM field? Should I go into a STEM field? Should I switch my major? Um, actually, I, I'll touch on that real quick. If I, I think we have a little time for me to babble, but, um, you know, I started off in journalism. I was going to be the lawyer. My grandmother never got to be because I was labeled by my mom, I was gonna be the lawyer, I was bright. So she said, I'm gonna be the lawyer and the one boy in the family was gonna be the engineer. That's just the way it was. So I worked all the way through high school working on law and prepping for that. Um, dismissing my, my science teacher, um, she telling me that you would make a really great engineer, you should be an engineer. I didn't know what an engineer was and it certainly didn't sound very glamorous. So I was gonna be a lawyer because Grammy was never the lawyer she wanted to be and I was gonna fulfill that. So um, I, I got into college and I uh, studied journalism, broadcast journalism because I stunk at writing and speaking and I wanted to get better at it. Um, and so, uh, cause I was really good at math and science. So sure enough, long story, but uh, the, near the end of my, um, probably my third year in college, um, I realized, what am I doing? I, I wanna get people to space, I love space, I might wanna be an astronaut. And um, I switched into engineering. And I'll tell you, it was unbelievable, a, a great thing, a great fit. I should have gone into engineering right off the bat. Um, but what I would tell people is, you know, I, I, we'll use Katherine Johnson. It doesn't take a math genius to do, you know, astonishingly, astonishingly amazing things, right? I mean, it takes, I, 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 I was certainly not a math genius and I feel like I have contributed um, to human spaceflight in a really neat way. 
Um, so, so I hope that people realize that uh, when you go into science and, and math and engineering, engineering is, is such a great major. It's a tough one, but it's a great one. It, it teaches you to think analytically, um, to reason through things, to solve problems, and not just problems in, in, in a work field, but problems in general. You really learn um, to analyze, to solve problems. You, know, you test, you try, you fail. And through that failing, you really learn a lot when things don't add up, when things don't get built, when you when you build a rocket and it doesn't fly I, a paper airplane. You know, it's something I loved doing. Um, you build a paper airplane and you fly it and it doesn't fly higher than someone else's. So you're determined to refold it and you fly it again until you get the right trajectory and it flies really high. I mean, that kind of way of testing and doing, I, I just think really um, takes our minds into a different path. So. I highly encourage both of my boys. Um, <laughs> they, of course, they had a choice, but you know they're going to be pursuing engineering at least for their their first um, degree, just for the way of thinking, for what it does to you for a base. I think it's incredible. Um, I'm going to kind of since I have the platform and we're talking um, science and math and STEM here a little bit. You know, I want to add into that. So, you know, Catherine Johnson, incredible, the the you know first man on the moon. Um, since then, we've launched, uh, I haven't done the math on this and adding this up, but we've launched 24 men have been to the moon. 24 men have been to the moon. Um, you know, I am unbelievably excited. I'm, I'm back in the space world. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm with an incredible company working with for incredible people. I'm so excited about it. Um, but I came back because um, the hope that we really might be going back. Um, feeling the momentum, the Artemis program, which is the twin sister to Apollo, um, is going to get the first woman and the next man on the moon. I'm not going to give you the year because we have to kind of figure out when that's going to happen. But that's incredible. That's ex so exciting. And to honor Katherine Johnson and to think about that, uh, I just, you know, I, I, I wish, yeah, I wish we had known about her earlier. We didn't. And how many people, um, you know, are we missing out on? How many, how many people like Katherine are out there that are being overlooked? And I think that's part of the conversation and part of the message I hope to get out here is, is we are, we need, to, we need to find them. We need to think about who it is that you might be at church with, or you might be, you know, um, coaching somewhere, or you might get the honor of mentoring or speaking at a school, um, reaching everybody at a really young age. They may not be this prodigy, this, this obvious math genius. <laughs> they might just be a me out there that somebody inspired me to want to work a little bit harder on something. Um, and that person could really do amazing things. So, so I, I think that's the message is, is for everybody is to realize that at a really young age, we have to, we have to inspire, we have to promote, we have to pull out the best in everybody because it's there. We all learn at different times and, and at different ages. Um, but it has to start at a really young age for us to reach down and think about how do we diversify? How do we bring out the best in everybody? Um, and so I think that's amazing. So last thing, um, I, I just, uh, I'm super excited about where commercial space is going and um, the inspiration. And I think there's gonna be so much work in, in the STEM fields. And so I, I really hope that, you know, people really open up their eyes to, um, to, to um, engaging in STEM majors more. Sorry for that long drawn out explanation. I really appreciate it. And you actually got into my next question. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, also what uh, uh, VP Poor said is it took a long time to appreciate what Mrs. Johnson has done. And in 2015, when President Barack Obama awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he proclaimed that she refused to be limited by society's expectations of her gender and race while expanding the boundaries of humanity's reach. And you did mention to us what we can do today and what is your message to the audience. I'm actually wondering what, what the message from, uh, from VP4 is when it comes to refusing the limits that the society is putting on us. How can we make our impact? So, you know, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about um, imposter syndrome. I'm gonna jump for a minute and kind of talk about this. 
you know, I, I, I know that there are scholars around our university to believe in the imposter syndrome. And there might be people on the evening that organize this to believe in imposter syndrome, but let me lay this on you and, and let's ponder for a moment. You were created to be on this earth and you were beginning given the opportunities that you've been given. You walk around in your world. How can you be an imposter to your life? If you've been given an opportunity to be in a space, you need to stand in that space. You deserve to be where you are. Yes, we have doubts and yes, we have insecurities. That's a part of being human. That's a part of just kind of how society sometimes does, right? Now I'll get into how society attempts to limit us, but we have our own security insecurities because we're human. What I want to tell people first and foremost is remove the theory that you can be an imposter to the blessings that are in your life life, the things that are granted to you. You're worthy of them. You're capable of them. You're qualified for them. So when they come, embrace them. Yes, you're going to have to ask people like Carrie, how do you do this? I don't know how to do this. That's networking. That's when you reach out to the dean and say, hey, dean, I don't understand what this means. Can you tell me, how did you do this? And then they'll explain to you, this is how you got, this is how I got here, or here's an opportunity for you. So it's about using what you've been given, reaching out to people who are willing to help you, making sure you recognize that where you are now is not where you'll stay, but you have to believe in yourself when no one else does. And that sounds a lot of cliches, a lot of cliches, right? But the reality is, that's how every single person on this call is where we are. Every single person had somebody that poured into them. Doubts creeped in, insecurities creeped in. Some people have more limits placed on them than others. Believe me, I get every bit of that. But you cannot be an imposter to the blessings of your life. Now, what do you need to do to break through that? You need to educate yourself. Educate yourself on all the opportunities that are available to you and allow yourself to tune out the best that you are able. Get a good tribe of people around you that will be able to carry you through those moments when people are attempting to limit you. Katherine Johnson, she was a genius. At the end of the day, someone, I think someone put it in the comments that they wanted to make sure that she was the one that was, that was securing the, the work of the computer. They didn't trust the computer, but they trusted her. And at the end of the day, she had to have people around her that when she was made to go to a bathroom only for black people, she was able to have somebody around her. They went together, right? They supported together. They fought together. They engaged together. They made certain that, that they elevated each other during the struggle, during the fight, during the challenges, so they can get to the celebration of what we're now doing, calling her name, stating her name, recognizing her worth. And so what can you do is, first of all, remember that where you are is exactly where you're supposed to be and that you can do what you're planning to do for your life. You have people around who, here who care about you at WVU and beyond, right? But you also have people who want to help you get to the next level um, in, in whatever it is that you have. And so one, believing in yourself and then two, surrounding yourself. The other thing and the last thing I'll say is this. In the sense of this work of discrimination, I mean, when we think about Katherine Johnson's life, she faced discrimination. There's no way to, there was racism, discrimination that was placed on her to stop her from, that was attempting to stop her from being able to get the education that she was worthy of. She did not allow that to stop her. We, because we are living in 2021, have a responsibility to disrupt the things that we see. When we see someone mistreating a colleague, a classmate, this is throughout your career. What you're learning now is building that character for what you're going to be with your supervisors and leaders of whatever organizations you may be a part of. So disrupting the behavior of discounting before you learn who this person is. Disrupting that someone certainly could not be as smart as they, they appear to be on paper because of a color of their skin or from where they're from. We are all from, the people that are from West Virginia, we face discrimination too. So imagine being a woman, a black woman, and being from West Virginia. We face discrimination because of what people think we are. We need to show them who we are. And if anything else, you remember who you are. Sometimes you gotta be reminded, but you cannot be an imposter in your own life. I did wanna interrupt for a second. We do have a question from the panel. Um, it's from uh, Kenneth Curry. I was impressed by the John Glenn quote that computers were okay as long as Katherine Johnson checked the numbers first. Because of his, because his life depended on it, how much progress have we made, and how much more do we need to make to really recognize strong women and women of color in key STEM fields? 
I think I'm going to pass this over to Carrie since I've talked. The, the, I'm going to pass this over and then I'll come back if necessary if we have time. Yeah, I think I think it's a really um, uh, gosh. I, I'm trying to think of a word to start to answer this. Um, it, it's a really amazing time frame. Um, the last few years, right, with with recognizing the inequity, and you know, I'll speak I'll speak on the gender. All right, because obviously, you know. I can relate with that. You know, earlier I spoke about, you know, when asked, when have I been the only female? When have I showed up? And, you know, I talked about just showing up and doing the work. I, I didn't talk about necessarily, you know, the feelings of, um, you know, the time frame where when I came to NASA as a, as a new young engineer, um, the, the training that we had um, and really, really over our, our over training, like high level training, not the training on my my field of expertise, but the training on this is what NASA is about. This is NASA's history. It never involved Katherine Johnson. It never involved, you know, and, and it mostly I think I had this conversation with somebody It mostly involved, you know, the, the figurehead astronaut crews from way back when. So um, the white men. And you know that's really, really was the strong sense of who the the go to strong um, you know astronauts and 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 jet pilots and so you know Catherine being one of those early ones to overcome that's amazing and along the way more had happened but certainly it hasn't been um, anything like we've seen you know in my twenty years. Um, I, I saw a lot of great, great roles for females, um, for white females, more so. Um, I'll, I'll say that. And they were few and far between, but they were there. And so there was hope. I can't, I cannot speak to how the, the challenge that has to be, how hard that has to be um, with the racial inequities that exist and still exist. Um, I think that, um, I see the world um, opening their eyes to it. And I see um, many advocates um, everywhere um, on this topic, but there's not enough. Um, but I think that engaging in these conversations, I think finding, I think being a mentor, being an advocate, finding a mentor, you know, finding an advocate. Um, I, I think it all starts with all of us. Um, I think, being somebody that can help knock down hurdles, being in a role where you can knock down hurdles and um, and remove uh, those barriers is what um, we have to do. We have to show up and we have to do it. And it starts with courage. Um, and you know, I'll kind of circle back. Um, and uh, you know, Maya Angelou, you know, the, the, one of my favorite favorite people. I miss her, um, but fortunately, we have so much of her of her amazing um, life's work, which was her writing and her speaking um, to look back on. Um, you know, I, I, won't, I won't do it justice to try to quote the courage one, but I, I used to quote it long ago, um, probably on my Facebook page, but you know, without courage, we're nothing. Without courage, nothing else works. You know, we can't practice integrity and all these things unless we truly can step up and get messy with it and have, do the hard stuff and, 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 and call people out when they're doing things wrong. And I think that's key. Um, I'm gonna actually, since I mentioned Maya, I didn't say it earlier, but I thought of it. Um, another quote I loved was, if you're always trying to be normal, you'll never know how amazing you can be. So I just love that quote and I'll leave it at that. I probably didn't answer that well enough. So Misha, you should probably go oh, for no, it. Oh no, I thought you did great. But I, and, I, and what I got from what you said is, is simply this, right? You need to be bold enough to care and driven enough to act. So you need to be bold enough to care about the differences that other people experience, that even though it may not be like yours. You need to hear yourself and understand that your perspective may not be like someone else's perspective. You need to pull back enough to say, well, it's all good for me, therefore it must be good for them. You need to listen to people when they tell you that there's something that's happening. Recognize and understand that the same space that you're in, someone worked to be there as well equally. No one was given anything and I keep saying that. The reality is you are as strong as the person that's standing beside you. And if we're gonna use this whole thing and I care, you can help me here. I got a feeling that if I'm going to the moon, if I'm in a room with somebody, I wanna make sure everybody beside me is smart. 
And I'm not questioning how they got in the room. I just need them to be smart enough to get me to where I need to be. That could be for a courtroom. That could be for a doctor's a patient when you're dealing with an operating room. That could be for anything dealing with a car being uh, developed. You can do it throughout any profession that you have. But you have to be bold enough to care about the people around you and driven enough to act to make sure that it's a better situation for you and to, for them. Because when it's for them, it will be for you too. And so for me, I think you answered it perfectly. I think it's recognizing where we are and seeing how we do this unite, how we unite together to make it matter. Thank you both. And that led into pretty much talking about resilience, but we are faced with, you know, lots of challenges and the times we live in is especially challenging with the pandemic and all the social inequity that we are talking about. How do we stay focused and keep our dreams at heart when faced with such, challenge, such challenges? What are your lessons for the audience today? How do we stay focused? How do we stay focused? Well, listen, the world is gonna open up again. And you know, we're kind of captive audience right now. Like, right, we're always, we're trying to find the next thing, whether it is a painting thing class online, whether it's a Zumba, media, meditation, or a good events like this, we're always trying to find something to do. So when the world opens back up to where we can do things a little bit more freely, we sometimes might step away from the things that we've learned in the last 2020 and now 2021. What I would say to, to, to anyone that's looking now is you need to commit yourself. You need to commit yourself to care beyond this current time. So basically care, be, care beyond your discomfort. And that means that once you get out into the world, it starts being an inconvenience to start talking about discrimination. It, it begins to disrupt your normal life. Because remember, some people weren't paying attention to it prior to the pandemic. The only thing the pandemic allowed us to do is now we're just all captive, captive audience. We were looking at the news, trying to find out what was the situation about the virus. In the same time, we began to see unrest, a murder that took place by Mr. Floyd. We saw things collectively as a community that we would not have normally seen because we could have scrolled through. We don't look at the news because we're cut from the cord. And we all had to pay attention that something was happening. Those same people that as a country have experienced this globe, we all, regardless of our race or our gender, are experience a social justice issue. And we need to remember and commit today, today, that we will stay engaged, that we will continue to still learn all the book clubs that everybody's looking at, all the webinars, all the podcasts. What are you going to, what's your practice going to be once the world, what's, what, what, what's your book club going to be? The friends you're making now, who are going to be the same? Are you going to keep up with them? The podcast you like, do you think it's going to stop telling you the same wonderful information in a couple of months that that's telling you today? It's not. It's going to tell you the same good, important information that you're getting now. You need to continue to pour into yourself because it truly is making us all better leaders, leaders in this work, leaders in what's going to make us move together as a country, as a university, as a department. It's going to require all of us to step back from our offensiveness, being offensive, but being offended or being on the defense and stepping into how can we lead collectively together. And so to me, I definitely understand it's easy, again, to go back to not concerning ourselves with it. But I, if anything, I would hope that 2020 and 2021 will change us all for the better, but we have to commit independently right now. Yeah, I, I, have, I have nothing to add to that. I think that's right on. Um, you know, I, I personally think about that. I, I love, I love a lot about this. I love a lot about this time that we have to to learn and to grow and to to put things into perspective on what matters. You know, what is the legacy? You know, what what world do I want? You know, my sons raising their kids in, and, and what does it look like? And and I don't want to let go of of a lot of the great stuff that's happening. And so um, I think that, I think Misha said it just perfectly. I appreciate both of your answers. You did talk about adversity. The adversity does not discriminate. You talked about the fact that we notice differences and sometimes we notice them because they stick to us like negative emotions, like Velcro pretty much, but you choose to focus on positive. So I'm going to ask both of you, what is the one good thing that happened to you in the last six months? And uh, how did that lead to a higher level of happiness or gratitude? So I'm gonna have to shout out my team. 
I, I, I'm gonna have to tell you, it's not that I don't understand how amazing the Division of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion team is, but I, I will tell you, um, you know, they were doing the very best they could to ensure that this campus and the faculty and the staff and the students in the community were being heard at the same time of processing the same information, the same hurt, the same harm that we all collectively experience as a, in, as a nation. And, and I think that oftentimes we get into this space and we, 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 we want to give this project as to what was there. But I think that when we talk about resiliency, when we talk about strength, when we talk about commitment, being bold enough to care, being driven enough to act, my team has reflected that. And I think uh, I, would, I would be remiss as if I did not um, say that that is what I saw, what I appreciated and what I, 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 I cherish. Um, about being in this space, being in this particular time, is that um, they got to see um, themselves. They got to see themselves authentically. They got to see that they were able to make a change and a difference. They got to see um, their voice. And I say that as well for myself, right? I'm not saying it as, as collective, but, but I think for, the, for what did I learn? I learned that I have an amazing team. And I don't, and I don't say that in a, in a flippant way. I don't say that in a way to say that other people's team are not. That's what I learned is not that I didn't know it, but I know they stepped into to the, to their authority into their space and I'm very proud of them. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's tough. I, I'm, I'm trying to even remember what the last six months equals. You know, it feels like three months or 12 months. It's all kind of a big blur, um, but I think I'm gonna, have to just probably focus again on uh, on the fact that this time frame has just um, you know allowed time and space to really, um, as I mentioned, put things into perspective and really think about that purpose and and really to um, to reset you know look at where the anchor is, look at where the the moral compass is. Um, you know, take a look at myself um, and, and, and where I've been, where I'm going and how I can make a difference. Um, and, you know, and, and I love, um, you know, I, I, I love thinking about, you know, the, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the negative speak or the, um, the self-talk. And, you know, I think having, you know, really, really focusing on helping others um, cause I, have been around some that helped me, you know, I have mentored, I've mentored, you know, a person who, uh, she now mentors me. And, um, so I think finding those people that can help you remember, um, and keep going and pushing forward, even when times are tough and, and there's a lot happening out there that we're all dealing with and, and, um, you know, it's painful. It's, you know, we're all trapped in our computer screens watching it. And I, I think that it can, um, you know, and at the same time, we're, we're trying to press on, you know, with our, our children's lives or our, our employees' lives, our workforce lives, our team's lives, and, and, do, and do a good job. So I, I think it's just the perspective. I think it's really, um, you know, valuing um, the experience and not just you know, I don't want to step in back into the real world and get lost and, 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 and lose the ability to have that drive to make a difference. Thank you. I have one more question for you. Mrs. Johnson said, I don't have a feeling of inferiority. Never had. What are your recommendations for keeping positive? And how do you keep feeling feelings of imposter syndrome that VP Paul has just addressed from taking away your chance to be a change, the change that you want to be, the dreams that you want to have, be the motivation that you want your other people, your the ones that surround you to find in you. Carrie, you want to go, you want me to go, it's whatever. It's up to you. Um, I'll say something quick and then you can finish with something amazing. How about that? Um, <laughs> No, I, I think I, you know, I, I kind of hit on that, that negative self-talk, right? I, th I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus on the female. I'm going to focus on, you know, what does it take to, to stay positive? Um, and, and a lot of that is, again, I'm reminded of this as well is, you know, where we can be our own worst enemies, right? We can pile on that 
call it imposter syndrome. We can, we can pile on, you know, the negative things, you know, we can have a, a mess up. We can like this, I can speak incorrectly and I could think, oh, but if you do it from the heart, if you do it for the right reasons, you know, and, and you do deserve a place at whatever table you're at, cause you're there and it's yours. So I think it's, you know, staying positive is that purpose. It's that really, you know, I, I, I'm here, I want to make a difference, um, and I'm doing it from my heart, um, you know, and I, I, I think, it, you know, drawing out that, that positivity and finding people surrounding yourself, Misha, uh, I think touched on this earlier is, you know, find your tribe, you know, you hear that a lot the past few years, it's so true, you must, you must, you must be around people that feed your soul and, 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 and lift you up. And you must do the same back, right? Find those people that need you to do that for them. Um, and, and I think that really just um, kind of um, creates more positivity, so. No, I think that's great, Carrie. I love it. I, and, I, and I'm saying like this, yes, yes, yes. Uh, we should tag team more often. <laughs> yes. um, what, what I will say is, listen, you all have work to do. When I, when I think about the audience in front of, a, you know, there's this listen on the call, you have work to do. At the end of the day, we have to figure out how to keep our spirits up. You know, we all have been dealing with the same thing, whether we want to see there's an equalizer, whether we've been, there's a some sort of an equalizer that we're all in the house. So how are you going to use this time? But also, how are we going to make sure that when we go out, we're better than we are now? So what I would say, how you stay positive? What's the type of music you like? I love putting on some music and dancing around my house as I'm cooking or as I'm cleaning or as I'm getting ready to get to work or whatever it is. You got to get that balance back, right? We're, we're not in our routines that we might be in, but you can control your routine. That makes sense. You can find a way to bring joy into your life. If it's talking to a friend on the phone, put them on a speaker while you're cooking. Hey, how about we look at this movie together? I think me and my mom looked at Facebook Watch this weekend for the first time. We found the movie and randomly just click the button. Hey, let's see what this is. Schedule brunch with a friend virtually if that's what you're going to do. You know, find a friend that you haven't talked to. You know, everybody needs somebody right now. We need to be reaching out and finding a way. You, there used to be this thing called pen pal. I don't know if y'all remember that. Some people don't. I believe in paper and pen. Uh, sometimes you can't get to a paper and pen. So my example of the pen pal is get on the phone and make that your phone pal. Hey, I just I was just thinking about you. Send a quick text message. Don't have time to talk, but you want to say I love you. Um, you know, so pour it into other people, whether you believe it, it pours back into you as well. The joy that you give somebody by just reaching out to people pours back into you that feeds you to be able to go back into another day. Having a good group of people around you that you can be vulnerable with, be able to say, look, you know, it was a rough day. I'm sorry, it was a terrible day. Or, you know, it was a great day and celebrate with them. So I think we need to be, we need to be able to, 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 to bring our concerns and our celebration to the people around us so that we can keep pushing forward. And I know that Ms. Johnson had to have done that. You know, the movie, you know, showed a little bit of reflection of that, but we're talking about we're talking about engineers and scientists. We're talking about lawyers. We're talking about doctors. We're talking about nurses. We're talking about people who are in the athletic world in the sense that they want to do athletic medicine. Wherever you are, you have a responsibility to be good to yourself first. And what I'm saying, you can't do and can't fix a problem if you can't fix your own stuff. So be good to you. Find some things that pour into your heart. And as Carrie said, if you're doing it authentically, if you're doing the best you can, know you're going to make mistakes. Know you're going to have some mishaps or maybe some things you say or things you might have overlooked, but you can correct it. And the goal, again, is being bold enough to care and driven enough to act. If you can do that, you'll be fine. And so for me, that's kind of how I find my positive. You have a good circle of people around me who love me and pour into me. And I like music, so <laughs> music and music, fruit and food. So I'm good. I got it all covered. All right, I'm gonna throw a couple more on there. How about fitness and food? I'll I'll stick with the food, but a, a little it bit. It's healthy food. food, healthy food, Carrie. We yeah. got to be healthy, right? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much to both of you. And uh, now I would like to open the floor for our dean, dean of the Sattler College, to say a few words. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pedro Mago. I'm the uh, Dean of the Statler College. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, including our wonderful panelists, uh, Mesha and Kerry, for uh, joining us tonight to celebrate the Black History Month and honor Katherine Johnson's legacy. 
I also would like to thank our uh, coordinator of DEI strategic initiative, uh, Sarah Seladinu, and our director of marketing and communications, Paige Nesbitt, for planning this amazing event. You know, part of my vision for the Stutter Call is, is to champion DEI uh, mountaineer values, right? And to promote, and su to promote a supportive and welcoming environment for everyone. Opening the door for conversation and discussions such as the one we just have today is an excellent way to inspire and motivate the college and university community to be leaders on their own right and to be a strong voice for a change. So Katherine Johnson is a brilliant role model for everybody, right? So her contributions were long overlooked, but she was a powerful trailblazer for women and minority in the STEM field. There are many lessons that we can learn from her legacy, and I hope she serves as an endless source of inspiration for everybody. So again, thank you all for being here, and I hope you all have a great rest of the evening. Thank you so much. So let's recognize today that we are in a time where we must inspire the next generation to drive the next phase of personal growth. That personal growth needs to stand on the foundation of professional knowledge. With inspiration from you, through your stories of resilience and your perspective on life and legacy of Mrs. Johnson, we all learn today to reach for the stars. Thank you for being with us and inspiring to seek and achieve our potential so we get to be the ones that tell the story and make the change. We will leave you today with Kathleen Johnson's own words. Thank you again for being with us. Well, now, if they just did the hard work that I did, which was my job, I did it every day. I never missed a day, never stayed home playing the stick and stuff. But my problem was to answer questions. And I did that to the best of my ability at all times, correct or incorrect. But that's my theory. Do your best all the time. The main thing is I liked what I was doing. I liked work. I liked the stars and the stories we were telling. And it was a joy to contribute to the literature that was going to be coming out. But little did I think it would go this far.